and program on Other Than Earth 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterna Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed without any censorship and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. New Year, New Me not so much for our economy. The struggle is real for many on the island as severe taxation and the rise of cost of living kicks in. With the reintroduction of pay tax, a possible hike in electricity prices, which will undoubtedly catapult the rest of the price structures to a higher level, and a possible introduction of more taxes are going to make things a living hell for most Sri Lankans. Why? Well, this is the IMF prescription. Liberal economic think tanks wanted us to go there instead of telling us how we could solve our problems by ourselves. And when it was told by nationalist economists to how to solve our problems, they laughed at them. And this is the result. The rich will survive, but you and I must squeeze the last drop out of our coffers to help pay the debt. Is it fair to ask the people to pay up for the mistakes of the elite? To make sense of it all, Tonight, I will speak to Minister of Justice Dr. Vijay Dasar Rajapaksa, former chairman of Bank of Ceylon, Rusiri Palathendakorn, and journalist and economic researcher Shiran Ilaperuma. Good evening. I'm Mahesh Joni, and this is the State of the Nation. A very good evening everyone, welcome. I appreciate you being here. There's a lot to discuss tonight, so let's get right to it. Well, in my opinion, Sri Lanka's struggles have just begun. On a long winded road towards recovery, and in that process, our nation's leaders are asking you and me to pay the hefty bill of fixing a broken economy. If you ask a four year old why Sri Lanka is like this, that child will tell you it's because of the decisions made by the big guys. So many wrong policy decisions made in the past 75 years got us to this point. That's a fact. As a nation, the question right now is whether we will do more of the same or whether are we going to think afresh and think in a manner that will benefit all of us. Sri Lanka is a democracy, meaning we've given our permission via a ballot to the elected individuals to govern this country. Our nation's leaders, we call them. They are the keepers of the nation, not the owners. But since the 80s, these leaders have acted as owners, not keepers. Yes, these very leaders have run this country to the ground. Basically, we work hard and earn, and they live lavishly. In 2023, we know our money has less monetary value. Our savings has become lesser in terms of, it, of their worth and taxes have gone really high thanks to the prescription by, by the IMF. We will see possible CEB price revisions in the future, pay taxes kicks in this month and the other taxes have gone up to an unbearable level. Every politician is talking about how Sri Lankans, you and I, have to tighten our bells and find ways and means of paying the price for their erroneous policies for over 75 years. It's funny, isn't it, that all these big kahunas up top, be it the liberal thinking think tanks, the typical political establishment, the top tier 1%, every elitist, they are cunningly foregoing mentioning anything about increasing wages for you and me. So at least we can live our lives in a bearable manner. Sri Lanka has enough wealth to go around, but like in the rest of the world, it's just circulating at the top tier of our society. 
Yet to save the nation, the leaders have asked both parties the same amount to pitch in. So the daily income earners who earn the bare minimum and those who gain millions through our resources pay the same price. Is that a fair game? Living in Sri Lanka cannot be a miserable experience because if that's the case, then leaving this nation would be the better option. But as many times I've mentioned, we do not have that luxury. So isn't it our duty to make this country a livable place for each and every one of us? If these taxes raised will help develop this country, build our way of life and increase the quality of the Sri Lankan experience, then I believe it's worth it. But the, said, the sad truth is that it won't. The taxes raised will be used to balance our country's budget deficit per the recommendation by the IMF. You can't kill the goose and expect it to lay more eggs. And that's precisely what's occurring right now. So it's up to us to think whether we are going to follow the same methodology promoted by the same goons who got us here. If that's the case, then expect the same result. When we as a nation desire a new outcome for our country, we have to break up with the old patterns. We'll be right back. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Last week, there was one question that I asked which seems to have rattled liberal think tanks and supporters of past protests. My question was pretty simple. I asked how come when Sri Lanka needed just $8 billion to stay afloat in 2022 to avert a full-blown pandemonium crisis, to avert defaulting, to avert payment suspensions, how come the Sri Lankan top tier business community couldn't pitch in to help find those funds? After all, many small scale Sri Lankan businesses across the board helped out to put the country back on track. It wasn't sufficient, but they did what they could. Sri Lankans helping Sri Lanka to avert a crisis mode. Isn't that the right thing to do? Now, since our last program aired, I have been wondering about this. We boast that our top tier businesses in the textile, tea, rubber, coconut uh, and other industries are gaining so much profit, especially during the COVID times. We saw headlines like, uh, we've exported 5 billion worth this, 6 billion worth that. And those guys couldn't pitch in to find 8 billion dollars? Don't you think it's a bit fishy as to why the top notch people some of whom are on many lists that depicts as the wealthiest companies in South Asia, couldn't help out. Well, Minister Vijayadasa Rajapaksa pointed us in the right direction. Listen in. I am not going to be able to get the money from the government. I am not going to be able to get the money from the government. I am not going to be able to get the Mono the Araganati and Piaver. Vartaman Mahabanku Adipatuma Locuma via Parico Sia de Nagin, Candava Latino, Avarta, Mepilibando. Panasad de Nai di Latin. E di Latina Panasad de Panasad de Nagi Varta, Nivara Dine, Sampurne, Aritatali Sundana Tama di Latne, E de Ninete, Varta de Nebe, E Barta Dunot Karapo Horakang, Eliatino. Exchange control act ka kati buna idda samasya panas tu ne angka visiyatare. Exchange control act ka kati buna ek paal ne karan control. The make aho si kara de das daate. Aho si kara lamukad de ginalati enne foreign exchange act ka control le kane management ka tevi tarak act ka gina. Videshi ratwal loli mudal nuge na amot mehi ganna puluang aparad me wagakima me panateng ibat kar lati ena. May the CVC part of the end of Varad, Karapu Varad, the Tamai may Hurun, Idatila Balanitia. Then Balana may Pahugi, Vasara Deker, Aragana Balapoma may Genapu dollar rolling. 
conversion rate එක රුපියල් වලට පරිවර්තනය කරලා තියෙන්නේ කීයද? 123යි පරිවර්තනය කරලා තියෙන්නේ. ඇයි? අනිත් මුදල් ඔක්කොම එහෙ රඳවාගෙන නොයෙකුත් හේතුන් කියලා බාණ්ඩ මිලදී ගන්නවා කියලා මේ ඔබතුමා දන්නවා තේ කර්මාන්තේ අපි තේ අපනයනේ කරපුවාම 180ක් විතර රටට ලාබනේ. අපි ඒකට අමුද්‍රව්‍ය ගේන්නේ නැහැනේ. एना 180 में पारिवर्तन है वेंडे पे अबे एपरल इंडस्ट्री का गत्तो एक ही सिर्फ पनाह के तरह थी बुना दंग ए उक्को में कटे कटो कर ला समस्ते आप पे दिया रगत में किये द सिर्फ विशिष्ट ना है एक निशा में को महापरिमाण जावारं कार्य उठी के विशिंग मुलु रटे में संपत्ति का मांगकोल लगा ला मेरठे जनता � पाउल की पे का सेपगान ना पाउल की पे का टाइप सुकबी हरा नहीं बनुए पीटर आटे गिनुंग वाले तो हम पत्त कर लती आगे नहीं ना सो व्हाट्स हैपनिंग हियर टू मेक अ लॉन्ग स्टोरी शॉर्ट मेनी टॉप टीयर बिजनेस कंपनीज दैट यूज श्रोलंकन रिसोर्सेज एंड लेबर टू क्रिएट प्रोडक्ट्स टू एक्सपोर्ट एंड अर्न हेफ्टी बाक डोंट � and then they go park those profits and revenue in some other nation denying the sri lankan economy its rightful earnings don't get me wrong this is a dodgy subject to talk about i might even get fired uh, for bringing this up because the corporate mafia is so strong in this country but the truth is the truth because anything other than the truth is what got sri lanka to this sorry state Now to understand how much money is out there you have to look at several reports indicating how much is funneled into foreign accounts and never credited to the Sri Lankan economy a non-profit called Tax Justice Network looks at individual countries and their tax evasions in uh, in addition they also monitor how big corporates have manipulated the system to stay wealthy and powerful by influencing the government structures Tax Justice Network has created a tool to track illicit financial flows in and out of various countries around the world. However, their focus on Sri Lanka is what interests me the most. According to their illicit financial flows vulnerability tracker, Sri Lanka loses 77 million dollars every year due to these big corporates abusing tax loopholes. Now just think to gain 77 million dollars in taxes how much of money should be out there if the calculations made by minister vijayadas rajpaksa are accurate then sri lanka could have lived as a debt free country then all those dreams of us being like singapore the us the uk and what not would have come true when you think about it before we actually turn to the rest of the world blaming them for this and that we should look inwardly to see the crooks in our midst i mean in 2015 the drive by the colombo twitter liberals who so badly wanted to find rajapaksa's magic money if only they were focused on finding who was funneling our hard earned money overseas by illegal means please we would have some dollars in our coffers i have a hunch If we dive into finding out those uh, who's responsible, those people that are funneling money overseas, we will see it's the very same Colombo Twitter liberals and their posh posh families. They are the ones who have been doing it all this time and also working hard to point the finger at someone else. Don't get me wrong, there are good companies uh, in this country that are working really hard to keep Sri Lanka afloat. But then again, there are the crooks. So how do they get to do this? Good question. Now, due to the inability of the political establishment to keep a corruption-free administration, these companies claim there are several reasons for them to park their money overseas. They say it is to buy raw materials. For some, it's uh, due to lack of confidence in the local monetary system, and for some. to avoid taxes under varying tax policies and inconsistency of the incentives offered again don't get me wrong for some companies these are legitimate concerns that the authorities are not addressing as of now but it comes to a point where you have to ask is it fair for the people of this country 
whose efforts to create a better profitable nation are denied to them by these top-notch corporates. I honestly don't think it's fair. Let's get uh, more information on this story. For that, I'm now uh, joined by the former chairman of the Bank of Ceylon and former president of the Ceylon Bank Employees Union, Rusirupal Thanakon, who has a vast amount of experience in the banking sector and a clear understanding of the loopholes that resulted in this amount of money not being brought into the country. Mr. Thanakon, uh, good to talk to you on State of the Nation uh, for the very first time. Uh, welcome. Now, the biggest question I have is how come these large-scale corporate entities who utilize Sri Lankan resources from tip to toe, earning billions of dollars, have been parking those earnings away from Sri Lanka and denying the Sri Lankan economy the benefit. Why has this continued to be this way for many years without being checked? Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you for providing this opportunity. Uh, the basic, I think the whole debate started with the revelation made by the, in the newspapers about a, a statement made by the GFI, GFI, the, the Global Financial Intelligence uh, Think Tank Unit operating in Washington, which first highlighted the gaps that prevail between the amount of money that to be uh, remitted back to Sri Lanka as proceeds of the exports. But then what is unfortunate about it is until it is revealed in this format by the newspapers, by the media and also with the information available to them from international sources, what did we do? Where did our authorities uh, act on this? How was, what was their monitoring? What was their control on it? Despite the fact that we had so many exchange control regulations, the Exchange Control Act and uh, the various other monitoring operations conducted by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the Export uh, Authority, the Export Agencies, all these were silent about it or did they just forget it or allowed it to continue in this format. That is what is worrying us. Actually, the amounts involved are very, very uh, important in the context of the present crisis that the country is facing. It runs into billions. Finally, what I learned was that between 2009 and 17, the shortage in the remittances back into the country, as which remains as a gap between the in and out uh, amounts, is running to about 36 billion dollars. Uh, so this is a huge amount. If we had access to it, I don't think we will be facing this crisis. So therefore, I think it is a very, very vital, important topic to be discussed at length. And thank you for focusing on this. Indeed, it, it really puzzles me as to why the mainstream media is not talking about this. Now, Mr. Thenekon, how do these corporates do it? What is the mechanism they use to uh, slowly earn from the resources of this country, yet deny the fruits of its labor? You see, the, the whole thing emanates from one point, that is, if they are subject to regulations and rules, those regulations and rules should take uh, due notice of what these exporters are doing. So if they are, left, if they are left to themselves to do whatever they want, this would naturally happen in any part of the world. This is not the only country where we have, we show these gaps in the money to be remitted and money that is not remitted. But the whole point is, these laws have been changing from time to time. Now, if you trace the history, in 1977, when we became an open market economy, the whole operations that were under the Exchange Control Act and the laws became changed. And there were some relaxations. And then another thing was, uh, the country was made to go under Article 8 of the IMF. The Article 8 of the IMF uh, stipulates uh, certain conditions that we have to observe with regard to foreign exchange transactions and they totally refuse to permit any kind of conditionalities or restrictions in these transactions. So in 1993 we went into this system under the IMF 
and therefore I think that was one of the opening where we relax these regulations. So if this whole operation extends back to very uh, far histories or long times, then that means this may be the start. But afterwards, in 2016, uh, Finance Minister Ravi Karunanayaka brought in an amendment to the Act and reintroduced this uh, need to repatriate. But to what extent was it controlled and monitored and observed? So this is the question that is not answered properly. Actually, what is in our mind is, if the exporters can keep the money there, they have enough reasons to do that. Yeah, indeed, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, despite not mentioning any names, Mr. Fenegon, these corporate entities we are talking about are very powerful due to the large sums of money they own. I'm sure we have heard many stories where politicians have tried uh, but failed immensely to hold these corporate sector accountable. Now, in your opinion, what is the best way to ensure that if it is made in Sri Lanka, then Sri Lanka needs to enjoy the profit it creates? Definitely. I fully agree with you, Mahesh, because this is, a, this is an area where they say that the exporters are performing a national interest task in the national interest. But the unfortunate part is, you know, the, the monitoring and the laws that are co controlling those are not effectively implemented and pro adequately controlled uh, to see that they are observed fully. So this re now you see the scams that took place recently, the sugar scam, the hedging scam which has gone into history, nothing more. And there are so many, and bond scam. All these things are, have gone, are yeah, part of the history today. But they have taken place with the blessings of the, and the support of the banking system, the system of authorities, corrupt politicians, and most of the trade, in the, the trading in this country, largely are somehow or other controlled or have a link to corrupt politicians. The investment monies have come from them from uh, illegal resources, they have access to illegal resources. Some of the big corporates who are operating today, if you trace their background, they started very small, but they grew big all of a sudden. Why? Because they had the blessings of the corrupt politicians and sometimes collaboration of the officials. I don't, I don't accuse them, but it has happened and we have enough evidence to say that they are silenced directs towards that uh, thinking to just to justify that thinking. Absolutely. We're relieved at that. Uh, Mr. Rusri Pala Fendakon, former chairman of uh, Bank of Ceylon and former president of the Ceylon Bank's Employees Union. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. On the other side, I will uh, dive more into this story and get a response from the government as to why this is happening. I'll be joined uh, by Justice Minister Vijayadasa Rajapaksha shortly. Stick around. This is the State of the Nation. Welcome back everyone, this is the State of the Nation. Before the break, we spoke about how several big corporates in Sri Lanka continue to deny the Sri Lankan population a better economy by hiding their profits or funds overseas to evade volatility in this country. I understand to a certain extent why they do it. Still the question that I have and I'm asking tonight is whether is it ethical and fair for the people of this country, especially when there's a severe economic crisis. And if they decide to bring that money back into this country, which they should, would it have helped to omit a full-blown financial crisis? So as the people's representatives, what can the government do? To understand uh, where the government stands, I'm now joined by uh, Justice Minister, Dr. Vijayadasa Rajapaksa, Minister, good to see you. And welcome to the program. Uh, you revealed in the House that over $53 billion are yet out there. Uh, uh, 
yet the non patriation of export earnings is not being exposed and told to the Sri Lankan people by mainstream media and lots of uh, you know mediums how come minister this era lasted for this long undetected by the authorities Mahesh this is a question that should be asked not only by you by each and every Sri Lankan citizen for the reason that all these earnings are hard-earned money of our people, our resources, our people's labor. Then investors have made all these arrangements for the exports. We appreciate investors because the investors are the backbone of our economy. But at the same time, every uh, businessman every exporter that who are making use of the service of our people, our resources, also have a duty, reciprocal duty, the amount that should be uh, repatriated or that is to be brought to the, our motherland should be brought here. That is the money that belongs to this country. What has been going on for more than 12 to 13 years, not really it was not undetected. In fact, that there is a dereliction of duty uh, by the central bank authorities, not only to monitor, to implement the laws of this country. Indeed, uh, Minister, what laws are you proposing to, uh, uh, to basically curb the non patriation of earnings? Countries like India have uh, policies uh, in place to ensure that the money comes back to, into the country. I think uh, around 100% should come into the uh, country. That's, that's what their law says, but uh, I'm not sure about it. So how come we are lagging on this? In fact, that our Exchange Control Act uh, was working quite nicely. It was not a lacuna in law. It was a question of implementation. The governor successively since 2005 have failed to perform their duty. In addition to that, there were too many interference by the politicians. The central bank is an independent institution. When the law was enacted, the lawmakers did not expect that political stooges will be appointed as the governors of the central bank. These stooges have failed in their duty and they are, they are the people who ruin this economy. Uh, in addition to that, in 2017, there was a new law replaced uh, by the, uh, to the, instead of the old uh, Exchange Control Act, that was the law introduced Foreign Exchange Act, where the proper control part was missing. That also helped to increase that large number of, uh, large amount of money which is due to us being retained in other countries. So far, none of the members in the business community or among the exporters had challenged or questioned the validity of the report that was issued by the uh, Global Integrity Report. Whereas that they have disclosed during the last 12 years that they had retained 53.5 billion in overseas, but that is not the accurate amount. The accurate amount is much more that may be the amount that they could have traced. Absolutely. Uh, Minister, uh, very quickly, through the grapevine, I have heard that uh, there have been countless conversations between the top tier business community and the government requesting them to bring their earnings back to Sri Lanka. Yet, in all those instances, um, they have threatened to pull their businesses out of the country. Therefore, the government has stayed silent. Will that be the same case in the future under this current administration? That won't be the same for the reason that the, that the circumstances for them to retain that dues in overseas, uh, there were several reasons. One thing was that, there, that the grip of controlling foreign exchange 
had been you know completely given up by the central bank in the first place secondly the stringent law was you know uh, the made uh, rather uh, flexible uh, allowing them to keep the money in other uh, jurisdiction the thirdly they also had a uh, very big doubt uh, about the uh, the rulers of this country in short that they had lost the confidence of our governance system and there had been many reasons contributory factors but our target is not to go behind them but first we must understand as to how it happened secondly to appeal all our investors exporters that they must be paid tributes to this country by keeping their money that nobody will in this country will be benefited they might be thinking that will be benefited for their for their families maybe for few years after that you know that sri lankan will lose all this sri lankan legitimately earn money that dollars means means nothing those are you know the sweat and blood of our innocent people indeed uh, minister we have to leave it at that thank you very much uh, that was dr vijaydas rajpaksa the minister of justice we'll be right back everyone this is the state of the nation now the imf has given this country a prescription increase the taxes and cover the losses translation throttle the neck of the people of this country and milk out the very last cent they have and somehow find a mechanism to balance the deficit in the budget the current slpp ranil wickremesinghe government is obliging what puzzles me is Didn't the SLPP government come to power promising the people that they won't bow down to foreign pressure and that they would find homegrown solutions for this problem? <sighs> Wonder what happened to those lions? Kill the goose that lays the egg or feed the goose that lays the egg? That is the question. Let's dive deep into this uh, conundrum. For that, I'm now joined by a journalist and economic researcher, Shuran Ilam Peruma. Uh, thank you very much, Shuran, uh, for your time. Uh, taxes, 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 high cost of living, and unbearable rates for food, medicine, and essential services, and skyrocketing inflation. Now, uh, Shuran, Sri Lanka is getting raped from every side. It looks like the IMF now owns Sri Lanka. Well, um, Mahesh, first of all, thanks for having me on the show again. Um, well, as you already know, and your viewers probably know as well, uh, Sri Lanka has defaulted on its debts, and it has gone to the IMF for assistance. So, yes, in a sense, uh, by default, we are locked into the uh, the IMF conditionality. So, if you have a look through the staff level agreement that um, we've established with the IMF so far, it is the very standard uh, package of. Um, quote unquote structural adjustment i suppose um the imf is asking us to um uh, undergo fiscal consolidation which means the government has to balance its budget it has to uh you know tax it has to reduce its spending um it has to restructure or privatize the soes particularly uh energy so you know uh, electricity water all those prices are meant to um reflect the actual costs of uh production um but the curious thing is there's very little said from the IMF about the actual problem which is not uh, rupees but dollars or rather foreign currency right um so we defaulted on our debt because we didn't have enough foreign currency uh, to pay that debt um so taxation per se is not going to really help us get on that path um you know one thing about us defaulting is that for the next few years the government won't really have to uh, repay debt because we'll be uh, negotiating on restructuring our existing um external and uh, possibly even domestic debt levels that uh, hasn't really been decided yet um and in the meantime the most pressing concern actually 
is uh, not finding rupees but uh, but finding foreign currencies so that we can spend on the things that we need, basically food and energy. Uh, and the IMF has no real solution for that except to devalue the currency, which we have already done. And we have done repeatedly throughout our history, and we've uh, not really seen much uh, foreign currency inflow from that. Shiran, uh, nobody is interested in talking about raising wages for Sri Lanka. It's not the IMF, not the government, not the opposition. How much can the Sri Lankan society manage this unbearable cost of living before its uh, b breaking point? Do you think the current uh, approach to tax everyone, which is making life miserable in this uh, country, will create an awesome economy as per the predictions of the IMF? Well, certainly taxation plays a role in any economy uh, and we would want a kind of just tax system that would uh, tax the wealthiest and particularly tax profits. Uh, tax the rentier segments of the economy and uh, for the government to recycle that into you know essential uh, services for the people uh, essential welfare uh, be be it healthcare or education um, taxation in itself is uh, obviously not a solution to our crippling uh, structural problems um, in fact one of the worrying things about the recent taxes is that there seems to be no direction from the government's part on prioritizing uh, certain sectors Right, which we need to develop if we're supposed to come out of this crisis. So, for example, uh, manufacturing, industries, agriculture, um, and even some of our export-oriented manufacturing, those really require certain incentives so that we can uh, you know, grow them and scale up Sri Lankan industry and come out of this crisis. Absolutely makes sense. Uh, Shiran, very quickly, why is China so silent? Do you think China no longer considers Sri Lanka to be a, a reliable friend Hence the silence? Um, I don't think China is uh, silent per se. Um, in fact, uh, if you recall around the time that we defaulted, the, uh, the Chinese side made clear that they were working very closely with Sri Lanka and they were trying to uh, actually avoid a default. Um, and China has done this with its uh, partners in other developing countries where they prefer to, uh, to refinance uh, loans and to work on new projects and try to get the uh, entire economic engine up and running so that the country can service its debts. Uh, so traditionally, they don't really go down the same, um, you know, IMF austerity path, right? They go on a, on a pro-growth uh, path to, to restructure debt. Um, in the last few months, uh, China has been very active, I think, in, uh, in providing aid. So there's been a lot of donations. We're getting a lot of uh, rice and uh, other supplies, uh, essential supplies from China. There was some fuel that was distributed to, uh, to farmers and to fishermen. So China is very much in the game. Uh, we should also remember that the entire world is in crisis right now. It's not just Sri Lanka. Uh, there is a war going on between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Russia is on China's border and a close ally of, um, of China. Uh, China has border conflicts with uh, India. Um, China has good relations with a lot of sub-Saharan African countries, a lot of them also debt distress and they need assistance. Uh, there's a whole situation in Latin America. So uh, unfortunately, Sri Lanka is not the center of the world and we can't expect China to sweep in and uh, save us whenever we get into trouble. Um, I think the onus right now is on the Sri Lankan side and for us to figure out what kind of uh, economy we want, uh, whether we're going to um, basically repeat the same mistakes of the past, whether we're going to remain a very um, you know, import-heavy, service-dominated, uh, backward, agrarian sort of economy, or whether we're going to basically streamline all of our policies and incentivize uh, industrialization to really incentivize the development of technology and manufacturing. Absolutely, Shiran. Let's hope for better times. Uh, we have to leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Shiran Ilam Peruma, uh, economics, journal uh, economic journalist and researcher. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment. The IMF prescription has a few unique features that cloak its insidious intentions. This is noticed by what's happening 
in Sri Lanka with the colossal tax burden on the people. A win for the IMF will be recorded if Sri Lanka is looking at a surplus in its primary budget balance. Basically, if we earn more than we spend, the IMF considered it as a win. This is the difference between the government revenue and the expenditure it undertakes on public goods and services. Now, on paper, this looks great. By this, I mean a budget that shows a primary surplus. But looking at it holistically, the deep-rooted issue starts to appear. Most of the things the IMF has suggested, like earning uh, more and spending less, restructuring the loss-making state sector, cutting useless expenses, so on and so forth, is indeed good for the country. But the problem is not about the suggestions. It's more about the time frame they have asked us to implement it. That's where the danger lies. The objective of a government must be to see its economy flourish and to see the small and medium enterprises, the bedrock of our economy, prosper. Daily essentials become uh, affordable and the cost of living is acceptable by all Sri Lankans. This isn't done with a budget surplus. If at all, what it does is show a positive figure at the end of any budget doing whatever it takes to achieve a surplus through taxes and extreme cuts in public expenses will not let the economy flourish but rather it'll kill it this is the same logic behind hiking interest rates in simple terms hiking interest rates would mean a reduction in borrowings by the smes the intended cause is to reduce the amount of money in the system and thereby reduce inflation look around you is inflation lowered to any sizable extent right now? When you take 1,000 rupees to the supermarket, what can you buy? And think about what you purchased in the past with that same 1,000 rupees. At the same time, look at what is actually doing. The small and medium enterprise sector is hit massively with not being able to reach its profit targets purely because no company is going to make about 30% profit to pay back their loans, which some banks are charging them an interest rate of 30%. This is what I mean by killing the economy. The very example I said earlier that this is killing the goose that lays the egg. I want to be very clear. Sri Lanka's public expenses need to be reduced and curtailed. I'm ent entirely in favor of it. Reasonable taxation need to take place to keep the government funded and the currency moving. But taxing a company's profits differs from taxing the raw materials, denying them the ability to freely purchase things needed to keep their industry afloat. That's when the problem occurs for the economy. It is a clear problem-solution mismatch. This is not the first time it has happened where the IMF has given this prescription. There are many examples from around the world to learn from. In Argentina, following the depression between 1998 to 2002, with extreme inflation and a shattered economy, the country was actually reporting primary budget surpluses for six consecutive years. But the economy is still suffering heavily. The people of Argentina are daily on the streets, right, even right now, begging its government to select them and not the IMF. It also begs the question as to whom we are trying to fool, or rather the I, uh, whom the IMF is, is trying to fool. Well, that's the State of the Nation for this week. Thank you very much for taking the time to check us out. Don't forget to listen to our podcast, which is released weekly. This week, the topic is about local government elections and the IMF. Uh, Mahesh Johnny, from all of us at Adhidharana24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you back again next Sunday.